Good morning, everybody. I'm, as the title says, going to talk about CoqDB and maybe the first question I should ask, who knows CoqDB? Just raise your hand. Well, it's slightly less than expected. Amazing. So I did a talk at WASH this year in June, and I did prepare an introduction into CoqDB and did present some introductional material, and then kind of halfway through the talk, I thought, well, everybody looks kind of tired. Why are they so tired? And it turns out everybody knows CoqDB and has been using it actually in projects already. So I was presenting the material that they knew by heart. So that was a mistake I didn't want to repeat again. So that's why I don't have any introduction material of CoqDB there today. But still, for those here that do not know CoqDB, CoqDB is um, verification using Python, so you have your hardware written in VHDL or Verilog typically, you run that in a simulator, but now instead of using UVM and System Verilog to write your verification code, you use Python. And that's what CoqDB enables you to give you a framework to write that verification and to connect to your simulator to actually execute the simulation. So that's the very quick intro into CoqDB, and if we have time in the end, I have a backup slides that essentially are the sim uh, presentation from June, so we can do that again. But maybe the more interesting question is, why is this Philip guy doing this presentation at all? CoqDB has been around for a couple of years now, I think it's five or six years, and CoqDB is well known as a project that uh, Stu and Chris did. They're both um, not here today, unfortunately. They were here last year. They presented CoqDB last year, and they presented it the year before. The challenge they found is that CoqDB is surprisingly successful, which is a good, bad thing, kind of, but actually led to a slight problem, and that is they have a day job, and they didn't have that much time to manage uh, CoqDB and get pull requests merged, respond to issues, things like that. So over the last couple of years, CoqDB was a bit dormant in terms of getting stuff merged upstream. And we at Fossi Foundation had complaints or people coming to us saying, well, can't you do anything about that? And it turns out, yes, we can. It took a bit of time, but there we are now. So that's why I'm doing this presentation today. I'm currently maintainer, guest maintainer, essentially, of CoqDB and make sure that um, things get merged and we respond to issues and pull requests. I'm not doing that much coding myself, but I'm just kind of maintaining the community and the flow of things going into the main repository. We're doing that since end of last year, and that started with actually merging the CoqDB contribution guidelines that outlines more or less what is the scope of CoqDB and how do we want to get patches merged, how do we want to do discussion. Essentially, it's the structure the process that I work on and that has been agreed by Stu and Chris so now we are actually able to spread the maintainer workload and make sure that we don't have a bottleneck there anymore going um, going uh, on in the future. So what happened? The first thing we did and I said kind of I'm bits the, the main maintainer but there are many other people working in CoqDB. The first thing we did is prepare a 1.1 release and that's already Interesting, since the last release was in 2015, that's CoqDB 1.0. That's also better impression came from the CoqDB might be dead. Um, so four years after, we had a CoqDB 1.1, essentially just accumulating all the things that changed. And it's a huge amount of stuff that changed. And I really, when I wrote that 1.1 release announcement, I tried to summarize what happened, and it was impossible. It was also completely impossible, uh, and just when, when you don't have meaningful things to say, you just look at statistics. And in the end, we were able to grow the code base between those two releases by 20,000 lines of code. So that's what changed in those four years. So there was a lot of active development going on. Moving on, we were trying to speed up the release process a bit, make sure that we get um, stable releases out more quickly. And in July, we had the CoqDB 1.2 release, and that's essentially the, the amount of releases we want to have roughly every three months. I wanted to do shortly before this OrConf, but um, actually my own vacation got in the way, so um, we still need to get better at spreading the workload. So we're speeding up. 
But now let's see what actually happened in CocoTP 1.2. And one of the most looked for features is the ability to install CocoTP just like a normal Python package using pip. So you do pip install CocoTP and that's it. There you go. You don't need to download the Git repository anymore. That's a major step forward in terms of usability and something that many, many people have been working for and um, waiting for for quite some time. The question is, why is that so tricky? And I'll get to that in a second. If you have ever written a Python package, making it installable by pip is pretty trivial, actually. For CocoTP, it wasn't that trivial. And we'll see in a couple more slides why CocoTP is a bit special. Um, of course, this is Python, so there is no easy way to install a package. Um, and you always have a thousand options, which makes documentation very hard. If you, so pip could be your Python 2 or Python 3 version. Both work. Use pip3 typically, but not always, for the Python 3 one. Um, you can install CocoTP as normal user and not as root if you pass the user flag, or in some distributions actually you don't need that. Um, and you can, of course, install CocoTP directly from the Git master if you use the, the GitHub URL and don't use the, um, the package name. So that gives you the ability to check out the current master version to try out new things right away. So that's actually pretty convenient. So that's the first thing we did in 1.2. Um, a more language featurey thing. Uh, CocoDB was around very well before uh, async and await and all that async stuff in Python was introduced. That's in Python 2.3.4.5, uh, something like that. Um, and what we always did is that CocoDB to a coroutine shows that this is a piece of code that runs as a coroutine, so in parallel to something else. What you now can do, you can also use async functions. And now instead of yield, you can use await, which is much more natural once you have used uh, async and await functionality. You still need the uh, CocoDB.coroutine um, decorator, and it's still not using the, the scheduler that Python would provide for those async functions, but it is actually using the normal CocoDB schedule. So it's just a syntax that looks slightly different. You can use that, you don't have to use it, um, but it makes it more natural going forward um, for those of you that use those functionalities already, or that have been using JavaScript, Node.js stuff, where you find syntax like that all over the place. Um, you can have generators that are async as well. So we start down here. We have want to get 10 samples of a signal that are even, so we have our device on a test. For those that you have never seen CocoTB, um, this is a test, a piece of code that will run a single test case and it gets past a device or the test that's a reference to the model you're simulating. And in this case here we want to get 10 samples of this signal, it's called signal, interestingly, and we have a clock. And now we do this for loop and it's really confusing with this projector flickering, but either way, we're up here, we um, wait for a rising edge, so wait for a clock cycle, and then we return this value of the signal back to the loop and down here we check that it's um, even and then that's it essentially. So you can use those generators now as again those are interesting language features that make your life easier in some cases but you don't need to use them. Um, everything else that worked before still works. A summary of the other things that changed in CocoTP 1.2 we had a huge amount of scheduler improvements and those are kind of those changes where you don't realize that there were changes until you kind of fall over some of the, the bottlenecks or problems that we had before. And there were a couple edge cases that triggers didn't work as you would expect them to be, especially in nested scenarios, things like that. So much of that work has been done by Eric, who has been a great help and a contributing greatly to CocoTB, so that's amazing. Same category of things you don't realize until you've uh, fallen in a trap somewhere. Exception propagation, so if you um, raise an exception in a coroutine and that coroutine goes somewhere else, what should happen to that exception? Things like that have been cleaned up and essentially the good thing that I can say is it feels natural now. So if you um, don't realize that there were changes, that's 
what uh, the way it should be. And the documentation has been cleaned up massively. There is still more to do, but actually the CocoDB documentation is in a pretty reasonably good state. Um, good. With that being said, that's essentially what we had in 1.2. What's coming up next? So there is a 1.3 release coming up shortly. That's mostly maintenance and cleanup in various areas. Um, and of course, bug fixing, as always. There is one thing that I wanted to talk about that is not yet committed, and there are a couple proposals out there. CocoDB is interesting in a way that it needs to interact with a simulator to actually do its work. So what you do when you have CocoDB, you start with a makefile. This makefile will then make sure that you compile a couple C libraries. Those get compiled, linked, and one of those C libraries is a C library that gets linked into the simulator or loaded by the simulator. And um, that's all slightly confusing, and that's why I tried to draw this chart. And um, you don't need to understand it all. That's, that's all fine. But um, to understand the motivation for the following changes is we have our simulator up there. Does it can be VCS or Icarus or GHDL or any other commercial or open source simulator or proprietary or open source simulator that you can um, buy or get your hands on. And those simulators all have a standard VPI interface, typically, or VHPI if you have a H, um, um, VHDL simulator, or VPI if you are GHDL, but anyway, um, so that's the interface we have, that's reasonably standardized, and then there are a couple libraries that CocoDB provides, and for historic reasons, there's a lot of libraries, actually you could probably link them into one, and what happens there is then at some point, Python gets invoked through the VPI library, by using the Python embedding framework. That's the Python here. And then this executes essentially your test bench, your own code. And to make it easier to write your test benches, you have the CocoDB Python module. That's pure Python code. And we compile another extension, or C extension, that then gets linked into the um, Python test bench. So this is a C Python extension, and that's a Python Python extension, essentially. So all the structure makes it reasonably tricky to get a simulation up and running. The good thing is about CocoDB has existing make files in there to do all that, so you don't need to know about it, but you need to know about it if you want to make it easier or change things. And there have been a couple approaches and attempts to get rid of those make files. And one of them is CocoDB test, and I'll go into the details there in a second. Another option is using setup tools to actually compile all those libraries. That's a Python method to compile libraries essentially at install or, yeah, at install time most, most of the time. And there is CocoDB test runner, which essentially gets rid of the manual writing of make files by writing a manifest file in, in YAML format. And there are a couple other options. Now let's have a look at CocoDB test first. CocoDB test essentially runs CocoDB through PyTest. PyTest is pretty much the standard unit testing, or one of, it's getting more and more standard, I guess, uh, unit testing framework in Python. Um, you don't need to make files anymore. Uh, Thomas has been working on that. You can find the code here. And um, if you are tired of the CocoDB make files, give it a try. How does it work? Just two pieces of code. You have um, a test underscore something, that's what PyTest uses to uh, find tests. And in there you have a run function that you give the sources, stuff that you would usually specify in a make file. You give it a top level and you give it a module, so that's your normal um, Python mod test code that you would otherwise already have written. So that's essentially this stuff replaces the make file but doesn't integrate the Python uh, the CocoDB testing code and uh, the other code itself. So that's essentially a wrap around that. You can run it then, just normal with PyTest, and this should work. Why do we, or why are people upset with those make files? If you run a standard Linux or uh, even a Mac system, you don't have a problem at all. Challenge is here. People want to use CocoDB on Windows. 
And the challenge is on Windows, you typically don't have a compiler, you don't have a package manager, and you don't have many other things like a normal shell. And the th going ahead, it makes it surprisingly hard to just execute a standard make file. Make it even harder is that there are a couple different Python distributions out there that people can use. So you can go to python.org, I think it is, uh, and download Python, and then you will get a version that is compiled with Visual Studio and a different Visual Studio depending on the Python version that you have. If you download it from uh, MinGW, you get a version that is compiled with uh, GCC. And depending on which version, there's actually two versions there, which one you get, actually the, the path mangling is enabled, so either you write a file that uses Windows path with backslash or one with forward slashes. Um, all of that makes it extremely annoying to write portable scripts. And the different compiler versions, as you have seen, we have a lot of libraries that we need to compile and integrate into each other. Some of them go into the simulator, some of them go into Python. It's an interesting challenge, let's put it like that. Um, the question is how can we make it simpler for Windows users by essentially saying use this and be happy. One approach is say you should use Conda. Conda comes with a Python that is compiled with GCC and gives you a couple other tools, a nice installer. This could be the solution. It's not clear yet if it really will be the ultimate solution. So if there are any Windows users out there, just talk to us and jump into the discussion because there are things like, oh, our company has this version of Python pre-installed and we're not able to use the other version. So there are a lot of constraints once you go into a environment where you are able to install everything to a corporate controlled environment that say it needs to be like that or otherwise we're not going to be able to use it. So if you have thoughts, jump in here, let us know. There's no other way than trying. A thing that came up Last year at OrConf, where Wilson was presenting um, Verilator, and somebody asked, yeah, why can't we have just CocoTP working with Verilator? And the answer was, in theory we can, in practice we can't. Things have changed, and that's good. So, we had working, it's, it's interesting, kind of once those projects kind of see the, see the, the light, it's interesting how many people have been working on that. It's, I have been over Christmas working on a prototype that integrates CocoTP and Verilator, and it turns out Stefan has been doing something similar. It turns out um, Todd has been doing something similar as well, and there are probably a couple other options. I know at least two more that have been doing something similar. And all of those were essentially prototype, proof of concept ones, but none of them really kind of pushed it across the finish line. We're almost there. And the main challenge here is not on the CocoTP side, but on the very later side. CocoTP uses VPI, that's the standard interface to talk to a simulator. The VPI um, support of very later was a bit, um, yeah, very, very limited. It just did what, whatever the person contributing it needed it to do. So the, it was extended recently. And um, there has been work, as I said, by, by Antmicro, they have been a kind of pushing much of that and Open Hardware Group, uh, the Chips Alliance has been um, active in that domain as well. So they have been working on that and there is a nice, really nice blog post out there on the Antmicro blog outlining how you can get that up and running. Todd has been working on that, he's in the room somewhere, I don't see you right now, but somewhere there he is, oh yeah. So um, he has been working on that and recently Stefan Valentovitz has taken over some of those patches and made sure that they go upstream and that's where we are almost now. Yesterday, in a typical Stefan approach of trying to do things very last minute, tried to get the last patch up at very later, and he was almost there, just roadblocked by a couple of nits that uh, Wilson had on, on formatting and small stuff. So we're almost there. It's great to see that, and I think in a uh, couple of days from now, we should be able to use very later CocoTB together. So that, I think that's worth a round of applause for everybody who was involved there. Thank you. That's great. And one last thing I have to say. Probably most of you know EDA Playground. EDA Playground lets you allow to play with a lot of EDA tools. And up until recently, there was only a very old version of CocoDB available. If you go to 
cocodb.edaplayground.com, not the normal site. You can choose cocodb1.2, and you actually can also choose newer VCS and other versions, so you actually can find an updated version there. So you can get the latest and greatest of cocodb on EDA Playground as well, so you don't need to install it, but just can try it out there. So Thomas was working on that together with Dulos, I think, and they made it happen. That's great. Final slide, CocoDB is waiting for you. Um, there is a mailing list, join us there. There is a web page, obviously. There is code on GitHub, and there is a Gitter channel, chat, chat channel, um, that I forgot to link here. Just have a look and join us there. Thanks. As a happy uh, Windows user, I would just suggest to use Windows subsystem for Linux. Maybe, maybe a quick follow-up question to that. Is Windows subsystem for Linux requires Windows 10? Are the corporate users in the room here happy with only supporting Windows 10? Just Okay. That's good. That's a very good statement. Thanks. I want to make one comment. Sure. For me, I'm, I'm using Linux, but for me, Getting rid of a make file is also good because then I can use Python as a master and not a make file as a master. That's, but uh, I want to talk about, I think there has been discussions what has to be in CocoDB and what has to be provided as external uh, libraries. Um, I've done a tape out, I've been working on Wishpoint support in CocoDB, so I, I want to upstream that now. So should that fit inside CocoDB or is that supposed to move to a separate? Because I think. Um, Temporek or he has been working on Wisborn before, but it was never up, uh, included in the, the, the main repository. Just, just repeat it for me quickly. Well, what are you working on? The Wisborn The Wish support. Okay. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. In CocoDB. So yes. what um, we have seen is that the core CocoDB is essentially the, the scheduler and the framework to make it able to run arbitrary um, simulations. And we have seen, oh, let's, let's go back. We have currently a couple bus adapters in there. There is one for Avalon, there is uh, one for AXI Lite, and there is, I think, a half-working one for AXI Extreme. Um, that's a state that we don't want to be in, kind of having those, those half-working things. So what we enabled with having those CocoDB installer by Python, you don't need to have it all in one repository anymore. So the path forward that we think might be most scalable is making it easy to have those extensions as separate Python packages. And now that you can actually use the dependency management that uh, pip provides, actually you can install the things together. And that's probably a better way to have a more decentralized and less bus factor of one approach to getting those things uh, improved quickly. Maybe I can also quickly comment. So we currently, that we, what I'm proposing and pushing is something similar to Sphinx, where we have like namespace chain, like, that's the thing, like, now that we go with Python 3 only, which is good, <laughs> um, you can use namespaces, and then I think we should probably have them as, like, in the organization, as repositories, like extensions, modules, interfaces, whatever, and then have namespace sharing for this stuff. I think this is probably the best way forward. Yeah, I, I was actually going to ask a, a similar question, but slightly differently. So one of, one of the reasons that people use UVM is that you can buy verification IPs for UVM, right? So if you, if you want to verify your AHB bus, you can go get uh, AHB model already pre-written and then just attach it to your bus and it has a bunch of assertions and will tell you if your, if your bus is working correctly. And CocoTB can clearly have these things, right? You can make a verification IP, an open source verification IP in CocoTB. Uh, so it sounds like the plan is not to have those be in CocoTB, but them to be some other projects. But is there any plan by FOSSI to like coordinate those projects in any way or have a repository? Yeah, I guess there are a couple ways we, we can do that. So one of the kind of the technical thing, where and which repository should that live, that's, that's, that's a pure technical thing. And the other thing is kind of how to make sure that those things are kind of coordinated and discoverable at the same time. And... Um, I'm, I don't have a kind of fully fleshed out plan there, um, but I, I, I see the problem and yeah, I guess the, the answer is, I, I don't know the, the full answer yet. So we, we have, as, as Stefan said, there's the option of having a 
separate repositories that live in a CocoDB namespace to have them kind of easily discoverable. There is the option to have that as a whatever kind of listing or actually PyPy gives you the ability to tag and, and connect things a bit better. Um, and the other thing is the coordination effort. How do we make sure that people don't write 25 different half-working AXI um, adapters? Let's see. <laughs> Um, may, maybe that's also what, if, if you look at commercial verification IP, that's also what happens out there in the market. Um, say, competition makes it interesting for for new pieces of IP to appear. Let's see. Um, yeah. On the topic of CocoTB verification, um, test bench suites, um, uh, at the moment, Ant Micro is doing an experiment of a USB 1.1 um, test suite in CocoTB aimed to test multiple different USB implementations. Um, we're hoping that uh, this will kind of demonstrate how to do that type of um, much higher level verification. Um, I'm sure they would love help on how to do this properly and make this work. Um, one of the things we're trying to do with that as well is integrate with the software side so that you can um, replay, for example, real-world USB traces from Linux and Windows. Um, you can capture them in like PCAP files and replay them as part of the um, test suite. Um, and that's supposed to all work through CocoTB. It's still very early stages, but I'm sure they'd love um, help proving yep. that out and making sure that works. So if you have USB 1.1 cores or want to help in that, um, definitely reach out to the guys at Micro and see if there's um, something you can help with in that regard. Yep. Thanks, that's a, that's a very good point and that's I think touching the area why many people are using CocoDB, it's very easy to integrate with um, existing traces or libraries that read those traces. Um, we have just heard kind of PCAP files that are really easy, just integrate a standard Python PCAP library, um, SCAPI for example, um, that reads those traces and feed them into your simulation. That's a very easy and efficient way to ex uh, interact with existing systems. So we have heard USB, I know a couple others that have been doing the same for Ethernet. Um, Unfortunately, he's not going to be able to present it, uh, but Julius has been interfacing, for example, with um, normal real-world real logic analyzers and replay those traces and then essentially get integration with CocoDB and testing in very easy ways. So, yeah. Yeah. On the VHDL side of things, um, in VUnit, we do already have uh, open source and free verification components for Axie, um, Avalon, and, and so. And those are purely v VHDL implementations. On, so those, are, those libra libraries are independent from the Python part of VUnit. So I believe that anyone who wants to actually use, instead of buying the UVM verification components, wants to use them even with CocoTB, it should work straight away because it's just like adding another module. It mm -hmm. doesn't have nothing to do with the other infrastructure. And regarding the organization of this verification component, we are thinking of doing just what you said. It, right now, it's everything in the same repository, but for the next release, we want to split it in different repositories, especially because not a single maintainer can take the responsibility of all the different in interfaces, so we want to keep the Wisbon in a repository, the Axe in a different one, so we can split the responsibility between different users. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, good points. Extraordinary individual. Yeah, I was wondering if you have been looking at uh, integrating with Idalyze for... Uh, uh, for the, the things you said where you specify your your input files as, as make files uh, using Edelice instead, and we're making it an Edelice backend basically. A Edelice backend. Um, I guess what what you would want. So in the end, what you need to do is you need to start a simulator with some um, command line options. So this would be more kind of using Edelice to actually start the simulator. This could be a way of using it. 
I'm not sure how you would make it an idealized backend. Yeah. yeah. It's. Yeah. yeah. I think it's solving the same issue like Google TV Runner in the end. So the question is, I think it makes more fun now that it's more Pythonic, Google TV. So it should be what, like, it's not sub process calls to make files, right? It's instead <laughs> proper Python, which is much better, I think. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a messy problem, and I guess. Uh, we just need all brains that, and all people that have different PC configurations and, and operating systems, and um, just stick their head together and let's try something out. Let's make it happen and easier. Okay, let's thank Philip again. <laughs> Hat sich das